welcome to the final talk of today in this uh, nanomaterials conference and uh, yeah you will see how the nanomaterials are also combined in uh, big materials like concrete concrete structures production where uh, and also in huge volumes and uh, yeah geopolymers you will see later they are uh, analog to zeolites and that's why they are, can be also considered as nanomaterials and in particular, we will see how we can use this kind of geopolymer concretes or mortars in the acid resistance uh, applications. So for this, yeah, we need to, to develop this kind of new materials. We need a measurement, new measurement methodologies and also mathematical modeling. And this is what I will be discussing here now. First, uh, just a short introduction. Why do we need acid resistant materials? Well, most of our infrastructure is made from uh, concrete. It's uh, the most used material, uh, used only less than water. So after water, uh, we have concrete. And, uh, but we also have some very harsh bio acid induced environments, like for example, in sewers, wastewater treatment plants, food industry, agriculture industry, biogas, CO2 sequestration. So all this, um, yeah, we need uh, acid resistance. Uh, infrastructure materials uh, which are made mainly of concrete and here uh, conventional materials are portland cement based and uh, alternative conventional is the calcium aluminate based but the new trend is now to develop geopolymer materials and this is what we are working already for seven years here in the TU Darmstadt is um, yeah, to develop a new alkali silicate uh, geopolymer based uh, mortars and concretes. And you can see here, I plotted the degradation depth and you can see that after 12, 18 months of uh, in situ exposure to bio sewers, that actually um, calcium aluminates have better performance and uh, geopolymer even more better performance. The only thing is uh, they leach. So here we see 44 days that we have the alkali leaching from the transition zone, but still the, um, the, um, we retain the mechanical property up to certain pH. So here we can see this degradation depth. Now I will show you a nice film, how we make a geopolymer here at, in our Institute of Construction Building Materials. So we need um, components is the clay, then we have, uh, we can use also other uh, waste materials. Then we have, uh, it's a two component. So we have a calcium water glass or alkali silicate solution. So we mix uh, this. So this is example of the self-compacting uh, geopolymer concrete. We did some almost like five years ago. And um, yeah, now our work is more only focused on uh, mortars. But that time we made also self-compacting concrete. That means it's uh, very easy to place. You can see how it flows. Um, and also there is no segregation between the materials. Now this is to make the cylindrical samples co for compressive strength. <clears throat> and you can see now, because of the clay is red, you can see that also the samples are red. And this is for the motor. Yeah, we had very high early strength, like 22 megapascals in one day. And uh, it's also, um, it's, there is no sedimentation. And Sinu, I will explain you the, why geopolymers are basically amorphous zeolites. So we have your, I mean, I think you're very familiar with zeolites. So we have this silicate and aluminate uh, thetaeders. They condensate, polycondensate. So we have a polycondensation reaction we have the, they merge with these oxo bridges. And um, yeah, at the end we get uh, amorphous uh, zeolites. So if, if we would uh, crystalline, crystallize further the geopolymers, we would get uh, crystal structures and that means actually zeolites. But in an amorphous state, state of this um, polymer change arrangement, we have basically geopolymers, which have some crystalline structure, but they in a short term, short range, but they don't have the long range crystalline uh, order. 
And we can see this equation also here with metacoline, for example. So we need aluminosilicates. We react, we activate them with um, alkali silicate solution. So it's a two component reaction. And then we dissolve the metacoline. We have the dissolved species. They already polymerize. And upon further polycondensation reaction, that means that we have uh, water as a byproduct. We polycondensate, we make a very big um, oxopolymers oxo with oxo bridges, aluminosilicate polymers. Now I will talk about um, the comparison of the SHTF of different binders. So we have here our uh, geopolymers. Basically, they have very low calcium amount. If we would activate other materials and increase the calcium element, they would. Uh, they had. They have a broader class, which is called uh, alkali activated materials. So geopolymers is only one class with low calcium uh, alkali activated materials. And actually, without calcium, this is what makes them very stable, low solubility, because they are basically uh, um, uh, zeolites. So we have the leaching of alkali alkalines from this um, gel. Uh, zeolite like gel and uh, then we have medium incongruent dissolution of aluminium from this uh, gel and then at the end uh, we have also silica gel which has the lowest solubility when we compare this to calcium based materials they have much higher solubility because the calcium uh, yeah from portlandite is the most soluble phase of cementitious materials and then csh gel so this calcium gel is much more soluble soluble than when we have alkali silicate gels but usually with acids we can have also anion acid anions like for example in sulfuric acid but then we have also expensive salt uh, precipitation which are inducing cracks typically this is a um, etringite or gypsum precipitates and in geopolymers, we can have some um, alkali alumino sulfates. And um, yeah, they, 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 in particular, in calcium rich uh, cementitious materials, they induce cracks and therefore further degradation of material. It, other example, if it's organic acid or other acids, they do not have the precipitate of uh, expensive salts. And this is mainly because they are highly soluble acid salts. Now for geopolymers, yeah, it's metacoline clay. It can be impure with quartz rich, and we can also use a very pure clay. This white one, we can see the X-ray amorphous peak of the amorphous metacoline. That means this is the uh, dehydroxylated uh, kaolinitic uh, clays. And as a second component is potassium silicates. And we can see we are using um, calcium or potassium, not uh, sodium, because uh, in that way we can uh, reduce the amount of uh, uh, leaching. And this leaching then carbonates uh, and with exposure to CO2, and this is known as efflorescence. Uh, yeah, now how to measure and model geopolymer leaching and acid attack. For that, we have certain um, standards for leaching in water. We can also adapt them to acid attacks. And um, yeah, we also have acid attack standards, but they should be there. Are, some of them are made for concrete or inorganic materials in general, and mostly also on plastics, but they should be adapted for geopolymers. For the concrete, they also don't, are not, um, they, they need to be adapted for geopolymers. And the crit critical parameter is the liquid to solid um, ratio. So how much, uh, acid solution we have and what is this, the, the sample size and this will then also um, influence our measurements and modeling results and you, i discussed this uh, simple model in this paper and also me measuring results in another paper and basically this is what we propose for geopolymer paste so uh, paste means uh, without uh, aggregates so it's a small downscale we don't use aggregates. If we use aggregates, we have mortar and even bigger aggregates than we have the concrete. But the downscale, uh, small setup, we can use only spaced and uh, then it's uh, coated in epoxy. So we have a one dimensional diffusion of materials and the solution. And that would then allow later to also model this kind of uh, acid attack and leaching. Um, of uh, alkalis and also aluminosilicates from our material.
So this is the setup we proposed, a new setup for measuring acid attack and leaching in water for the geopolymer materials. There is another method with the titration. This is uh, done on alkali activated materials in sulfuric acid. So for sulfuric, this one is done acetic acid. So we have a big buffering capacity of the acid, but for sulfuric acid, it's a strong acid. And um, yeah, we need to titrate to maintain the pH. So now we can see some results. So this is the leaching time and we have the concentration, how much of uh, alkali, we can see the alkalis are leaching the most. Then we have a little bit of leaching of uh, aluminates and silicates. And um, yeah, here we can see also in pure water. So this is in one, 0 0.1 molar acetic acid. And here we can see in pure water and pure water, we have an order of magnitude to lower concentrations of uh, alkalis that leach out. So with pH, with the acid, what we could also expect, we have higher leaching of uh, alkalis. I will explain the mechanism later. But if we convert these um, measurement curves into um, when we plot them as a logarithmic and also as a rates. So if we measure them as uh, milligrams of leached species per day and per square area, uh, this area of this uh, on the top, yeah, the rate. And the rate actually decreases with uh, leaching time. Then we can also use this data to apply it on the diffusion model. And he here for this, we need to have the cumulative fraction leached. This is proposed. It's based for the leaching of um, in water for the, for example, radi radioactive solids, radi radioactive waste in concrete. And uh, I used also this cumulative fraction leach. The, the new novelty in this paper was to propose to use the same, to adapt that method also for leaching of uh, geopolymers. And um, we need to use cumulative fraction leached because uh, this value should not be too high. Otherwise, we cannot use the one-dimensional diffusion-based uh, models. And the diffusion-based models also include actually the reaction part. And this is the apparent diffusion where we can have the effective or the morphological effect of the diffusion, basically. And also here we have the um, binding capacity or the reactive term. So how much alkalis are binded? And then we have this apparent diffusion coefficient, but we can still we can still uh, use the diffusion-based model to 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 model diffusion and chemistry part, and uh, we can see a very nice uh, yeah calibration that it's it's um, we have nice results. This is for in acid how much alcohol is already leached out and in water. And of course, uh, in acid, we have much higher leaching of alkalis. And But in both cases, very good agreement with diffusion-based uh, model, one-dimensional. I mean, for the experiment, it should be, we should take care that it's one-dimensional and it should not leach uh, too much. So there is some threshold, which we discussed in this paper, because we need to take into account the depletion of the solids. So now I will show some results uh, for pure metacolin in different acid concentrations. And we can see, yeah, uh, when we um, decrease the acid concentration, we basically reach, this is the, the diffusion in pure water. And um, yeah, we can see here the effect of the pH of the acid on the, on the leaching of alkalis. This was for the pore solution analysis. So we analyzed the pore solution how much is leached into the pore solution. We replenish every time the, the pore solution. And by replenish, replenishing, we measure the concentration in the pore solution. But we, at the end of the experiment, we also have the uh, cross section of the solid of the sample. And we can see here from this side was the acid attack. And by doing the scanning electron microscope with EDS mappings, we can do, we can produce very nice uh, microstructural elemental mappings for different um, elements. And if we statistically analyze this, we can see that the, we can get the profiles per depth of the material, how the um, material potassium, aluminum and silicium is leached out. And here we can see that um, yeah, potassium is, uh, is 
the most leached out element. Then we have the uh, leaching, the alumination here. So it's also incongruent dissolution of the aluminosilicate gel of the geopolymer. And then, yeah, here we can see some even enrichment of the silicates, silica gel. Now results uh, also on modeling in sulfuric acid I will present. Um, so this is um, measured also from the, these profiles, potassium, uh, and we can see with exposure time that uh, when we fit this to the diffusion-based model, that we have here some uh, deviation from semi-infinitive model assumption. So the diffusion-based model, if it's simple, it assumes semi-infinitive uh, sample, but because of the limited dimensions of the sample, this is why the volume to solid ratio in this uh, design of the experiment is very important, because if we start to deplete sufficiently uh, above around 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, we get <clears throat> these deviations from the model because uh, the, <clears throat> the model assumes semi-infinitive sample, but the sample is limited, so we have a depletion of the um, of the potassium in the in the solids. Here we can also see some even more um, for um, pH two. So here, um, yeah, it's di different mix design, and uh, here we also have um, yeah we have. Um, this deviation from the model, and this is due to precipitation reactions, sulfates precipitation. Now to summarize, yeah, I showed you that um, these elemental mappings are a very powerful tool for, uh, for investigating geopolymers degradation. We saw that uh, we have a gradual dissolution of uh, potassium, and then in water, we also have a uh, the solution of aluminum and silicates also in uh, acid, but here somehow silicate is even more dissolvable than in acid. So this is the multi-stage mechanism of geopolymer acid tech. So we have this cation exchange reactions between um, between potassium and and uh, proton from the acid. Then we have the delamination reaction the dissolution precipitation of salts if the in acetic acid it's highly soluble but in sulfuric acid we have the expensive uh, precipitation of gypsum for example as a, which um, creates uh, cracks and here we have then the solution uh, recrystallization of silica gel this is also depicted here so with acid attack we have the delamination also these alkalis which are uh, charge compensating the extra aluminum negative charge here so they they are leached out because we have here proton that comes in here we in, in the papers i showed you you can see the new standard proposal for the new standard for leaching in the pure water which was adapted for acid attacks of geopolymers and uh, in that case we can use we propose to use the diffusion based model from the other standards and uh, also for geopolymers and acid attack and that did they because this can then accurately represent the cumulative fractional release and this is important also if you want to model with a diffusion based model to the, determine the diffusion apparent diffusion coefficient for the leaching thank you very much i am now ready for questions <laughs>